Hey, Mark. Hello again. We were having a great conversation, and Skype shut us down. So let's uh, <laughs> let's get rolling again. It must be it must be the Zoom bugs. Yeah, yeah. I I blame Zoom for everything in my life. But uh, we're we're talking about some of our our intellectual roots, and we were talking about Walter Williams and and what an inspiration he was for me when I was at George Mason University as a as a trained economist. I've tried to spend my life translating. The logic of economics into powerful stories and in plain English, and and Walter was essentially the the founding father of that. He, well, him and he and Thomas Sowell, I think, did a tremendous job, and they and they were big influences on you pretty early on, right? Yeah, I mean, Rand Rand was the first influence uh, through through my friend at a theater company, whom I couldn't defeat in in debate. Um, I finally decided that. Uh, I just didn't have the words, but if I gave him the right books, he would see things my way. So I said, let's have a book exchange. I gave him five books that I thought were the most influential books in my life at the time, and he gave me The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Um, my books, I don't think, had much of an impact on him, but certainly Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead uh, put me on a different track. And I feel like before I got to where I am today, which is a full-blown capitalist, I had to travel through some stages, and uh, in those those stages took me through a type of conservatism and exposed me to people like Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell. I don't know that I would call them conservatives, but they're certainly embraced by the conservative movement. And so I would read their syndicated columnists, their co the syndicated columns every week or so in a in a uh, in a newspaper called the Conservative Chronicle, which just had uh, you know some some great thinkers. Um, editorial editorials in there and I would read those and then I just started picking up their books and uh, and they helped me along the way through that stage it, it took me a couple of years to get out of that stage and into what I call more more liberalism or classical liberalism which which book did you read first the Fountainhead or Atlas I read the Fountainhead first and then Atlas shrugged so I've always, I don't know where you are in this but I've um, I, I read them in that order as well. I actually discovered Ayn Rand reading the liner notes on a Rush album, uh, 2112, <laughs> dedicated sure. to the genius of Ayn Rand. And I was 13, so I had no idea who it was. I thought it was a guy. And I was like, who's that dude? But but I found a, an old earmarked copy of Anthem at a garage sale. Wow. And that that was my gateway, and I devoured it. And and I, as I recall, that book was so old that it had been published before Atlas Shrug was published. So when it said in the inner liner notes what else she had written, it was We the Living and the Fountainhead. Um, but ultimately, I was related more to the Fountainhead as uh, I'm kind of a, a right-brained kind of guy that that really appreciated the, the story about artistic integrity. Um, you're an actor. You, your, your resume is way too long. Um, for, for me to tell people about. And I, I, I do want to get into some really important things like the Big Lebowski and, and Lost. <laughs> but uh, um, were you, did, you, could, did you connect more with the Fountainhead than Atlas or vice versa? Well, it's like you, I mean, as an as a aspiring artist, the Fountainhead, you know, gave me a sort of a, a roadmap for, for ethics and for integrity, artistic integrity. And so I identified quite a bit more with with actually both both principal characters with with Keating because I felt there were aspects of my character that were uh, sort of like that guy and uh, and and Rourke. I mean, look, I, I feel like we're we're born in a world of mixed premises, so I think we all have a, a little piece of some of those all of those characters in us. Um, but definitely, it gave me a goal, uh, an artistic goal. Um, to, to shoot for, for full integrity. And, and it, it, it let me know that the perfect man is possible. The perfect human being is possible. It's, it's not what the culture tells us it is. It's just a person with unbreached integrity. And that's with it. That's certainly within my power to attain that. I can't be Jesus. I can't cure blind people uh, or cure sicknesses, but I can have uh, perfect integrity if I choose. Uh, yep. I thought that was a, I was thought that was a fantastic message for an artist. And I I I forced myself. Howard Rourke is someone that forced me to get past my own insecurities about what I was capable of doing. And for instance, um, 
one of the things I, I used to love to write when I was a teenager, but I was scared to death of speaking in public. And there's this great line from The Fountainhead where Howard Rourke is kind of uh, gently scolding Peter Keating um, because Peter Keating is asking him what to do with his career. And, 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 and Howard says back, uh, how, how, how don't you know? How can you not know this is the most important decision you can make in your life? And, and at the time, I didn't know. So I, I put it up there just to sort of goad me into trying to figure things out. And, and, and to me, it's a, it's a process. Like the, the ideal person that you want to be is always a, a process of, of, of trying to achieve that goal as opposed to something that you can sort of achieve when you're 30 years old and then just check that box and, and sit around. But uh, to me, that's, that's actually the, the primary thing. Um, I didn't know we'd go here so early, but the primary thing I wanted to talk about is you're, you're an objectivist, you're a huge Ayn Rand uh, enthusiast and explainer. And I feel like she has gotten a bad rap and some of it is the words that she uses, which um, today have very different meanings than perhaps she intended. <clears throat> One of those words is selfishness. And I always, I always parse that word. I, I, I would never use that word because I think, I think it's got a lot of unfortunate baggage to it. But um, in her sense, as a young woman that was fleeing the Bolshevik revolution, she watched her family destroyed um, she gave up everything to come to America, which she viewed as this this ideal of individualism. For her, selfishness was just defending yourself and the idea that the individual person is worthy of defense is is sort of the moral building block by which civil society functions. Um, how do you how do you explain um, her her moral philosophy to people that that haven't read the books or haven't sort of gone through the courses. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that selfishness in essence means you have a right to be the beneficiary of your own action. You you have the you have the right to to the the moral benefits of of what you do. And uh, you're right, uh, selfishness has taken on certainly a different meaning over the years because our society is more or less monopolized by um, altruism. And so it views all moral concepts through the lens of altruism, including the, the idea of self-interest. Um, and that's all selfishness is, is looking out for your own interests, um, which every living creature does. Um, human beings just do it in a particular way. Uh, and the way that humans being, human beings look out for their interests is, is by being rational, which, which presumes in, or assumes in, in, in my interpretation a long-term uh, a long-term vision of what you're trying to do with your life and uh, so there's no such thing as a as short short-term gains or short-term interests or, or looking out for yourself to the exclusion of others since all of those uh, don't take in the long term which is what a human being has to do so I, I try to define you know morality as a, essentially an, an individual uh, approach to life it's not necessarily connected to other people it's about um, coming up with the types of values you need to live and thrive as an individual and then there are certain applications with respect to that that you know include and incorporate other people in your life but um, you are always the primary the primary value so I, I was uh, before the um, lockdowns one of the last projects that that I did with my wife Terry is we gave a series of lectures on Ayn Rand and, and what she means to us at something called the Prometheus Academy um, I, I, I see that you had a conversation with Craig Biddle who is, who is one of the uh, premier objectivists, in my opinion, in modern society. And, and our purpose was a little bit different. I'm, I'm not an objectivist philosopher, but I, I, I find her, her sense of individualism to be um, the core of what's missing in, in our modern conversation. And, and one, of the, one of the things that, one of the lectures we gave was the I, I entitled it The Moral Superiority of Romance. And 
and a, and a big part of that, and obviously she was she was a romantic, and that was her artistic philosophy, and and her books have good guys and bad guys, and and the good guys struggle and strive and ultimately succeed at their goals. To to me, that's the essence of 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 what romance is. Um, but one of the things that it, people overlook in her books, starting with Prometheus and Anthem, is the fact that these these hardcore radical individualists, the, the, the guy that learned how to say I instead of we in that first novel, um, he set out to create a community. And at the end of the book, he has this dream of, of creating a, a community of, of like-minded individuals that want to co cooperate and do something bigger together and and you you forget about that part of Rand that that she was pro community in in the most constructive way I would think about the word community. Oh, indeed. I mean, all of, all of her characters, even in Atlas Shrugged, tremendously individualistic, but they form a community called Galt's Gulch, and and uh, Dagny herself um, wants love and wants connection, wants to be reflected wants to see her values reflected in another person almost as desperately as she wants to save the railroad, or I'd say maybe even more so. And that's what brings her and John Galt together. Spoiler alert for everybody, but um, that's what brings them together. So, uh, I mean, for Rand, it, it, would see, it would seem to me that the, the good life is one that has purpose and love in it. Those are, those are the two most important values that I think anyone can pursue. And, and love clearly includes lots of other people, lots of potential other people. So um, acting for your values includes love and includes a whole community of human beings. I, I can't imagine uh, Dagny deserting John Galt when he needed her, right? Or even right. dying for John, or even he dying for her, as he said he would. Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, you know, the misunderstanding of that and, and her her understanding of romantic love as an exchange of values. There's a little bit of Jordan Peterson in there in the sense that, um, you know, before you can love somebody else, you got to get your own shit together, right? Mm -hmm. You have to respect yourself. You have to, you have to, to be worthy of being loved. And to me, like right now I'm watching young people, you know, we, we talk a lot about, economic dignity in the context of, of so-called democratic socialism, a contradiction in terms, but um, people are looking for dignity right now. And I feel like this is one of the reasons why Jordan Peterson is so popular because, you know, the, all, of, all of his other messages aside, he's basically like, you got to get yourself together because if you don't give a damn about yourself, nobody's going to do it for you. And um, he wouldn't attribute Rand to that idea, but that that's where I got it from. Well, I also feel like that when dignity started entering the the equation of rights and dignity as sort of married together, you know, of course, the crass materialist socialists put that into materialist uh, framework, which is dignity implies having enough to having enough material sustenance to carry on with your life. Uh, I don't look at it that in those terms at all. One of the great things about objectivism is most of the virtues are epistemological in nature. So I would say dignity is actually more related to autonomy and independence. Real human dignity comes from being able to think and act for yourself and, and, and be able to experience the fruits of thinking and acting for yourself. That's where dignity really comes, regardless of where you are in the economic or material scale. If you're not free and independent, you're not going to feel very good. You're not going to have much dignity. Yeah, and, and the idea that uh, a piece of legislation or some third party endorse, endorsement that says you're you're a good person, it's it's so shallow. I I feel like it may actually be pushing young people in the opposite direction where they they struggle with depression and dependency and and waiting for someone to tell them that they're okay. It's a very toxic ideology. Well, you, you also have to factor in that radical skepticism is the dominant sort of epistemological approach to the world right now, um, which I think lends itself to psychopathy and to anxiety, because ba basically radical skepticism is not about questioning everything. It's, 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 it makes a claim on the efficacy of your knowledge and on the efficacy of your capacity to know. And the claim is that you can't know. 
Now you tell that to a kid enough, or you fill them enough, even with the with the the, the mechanisms that uh, radical skeptics use to try to undo knowledge, and you're going you're you're creating a Frankenstein's monster of anxiety, and angst and pain and in in incapacity and low self-esteem that you try to make up with with these uh, what do they call them uh, ac attributions or what do they call them uh, con uh, affirmations but you know self-esteem is about your relationship to the world it's it's not so much about what you tell yourself that's part of it for sure but the main of it is how you how you live and act in the world you know we're sort of playing this out right now with these never-ending lockdowns and and this new particularly dangerous ideology, I call it safetyism, but it's basically the political class um, preying on our fears of the unknown, in this case a virus, but you know, they've, they've tried this uh, to, to stoke our fears with, with countless other issues. And it, it seems like they're trying to break particularly young people, you know, you're, you're locked inside, um, we've taken your job away, we're replacing it with a government check. And um, whatever you do, you maybe you're vaccinated, um, but you still have to wear two masks. You still probably shouldn't go outside because there's still a risk there. Um, I don't know if this is purposeful or not, but it seems like a culmination of, of this toxic ideology that, that Ayn Rand warned us about. Yeah. I. It's uh, it's not purposeful in the sense that these people planned it. They've, they're certainly, I, I think they their ideology takes them in a certain direction, and then sort of a confluence of forces pushes it um, where it does. Uh, but the stand the standard that these statists use with respect to our condition, our, our our health, is very similar to the standard the radical skeptic uses with with respect to knowledge. So, uh, since knowledge is imperfect, since you can't know everything, it's contextual, right? Certainty is provisional or contextual. They'll say you can't know. And since there's no such thing as perfect health, right? Not everybody will, will be uh, wealthy. Not everybody will be perfectly healthy. Then they, they use that as the standard to step in and try to uh, adjust uh, reality, to try to, uh, to try to uh, capture that, that perfect goal that is uh, never quite attainable. Um, but I don't know that it's, they, they, you could, they couldn't have planned this, you know, they couldn't have planned it, but they, they had all the, the ducks in a row when, when the situation allowed for them to do what they did. Yeah. Some, some combination of paternalism and, and, uh, uh progressivism just sort of kicked into place where we suddenly deferred which should have been local decisions and, and personal decisions and local knowledge. And we suddenly deferred to the experts in a way that the original progressives would have dreamed of, right? So finally, the scientists are in charge. Um, there's this, uh, the guy that supposedly came up with the word socialism, um, Saint Simon, a French aristocrat, um, his original conception of socialism was a council of all powerful scientists that were going to rearrange society from the top down. And I couldn't help rethinking about that in the, in the context of um, literally my neighbors in Washington, DC are waiting for Fauci to tell them what to do. And I'm like, what, what, what bizarro dystopian hellhole is this now that we've created? Yeah, and Fauci loves it too, you can see. He's reveling in his new celebrity and power. So well, let's go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, I hope there's enough of that um, American sense of life, rugged individualism and, and antipathy towards uh, authority, uh, arbitrary authority that rebels against this in the long run. I, I haven't seen it as widespread as I wish it would be. But uh, I think the beauty of a federalist system is some states are rebelling and 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 doing well as a result of that. Well, I know you've I know you're a, a, a co-founder of a of a new political party, the American Capitalist Party. Um, but uh, my sense is that you as a successful actor in Hollywood, um, first of all, you're taking tremendous risk by, by expressing opinions that, that fall outside of the mainstream of Hollywood. Um, but you, you, you must also get um, inherently the idea that, that 
um, values and ideas ultimately come from culture and not politics. And and you you must have felt an obligation to speak up at some point. Why why are you speaking up? Have you always been this opinionated, or is this a is this a newish thing? Um, yeah, I, I I usually don't speak up unless somebody asks me specific questions. Um, I've been very open when I'm on sets. If people want to talk to me about things, I'm, I, I never hide what I am. Uh, I did feel that uh, once I got on social media, I think in 2013, over the year, over the year from 2013 to 14, I began to see a shift in the tenor of the conversation. The, uh, and I saw a bully culture start to rise. And I saw that it was intimidating a lot of people. And I decided that you know, I was going to apply my my school ground knowledge of bullies to social media, uh, which is basically if a bully attacks you, you got to fight him, uh, and that usually makes them think twice about uh, attacking you. And the more you give in, uh, the more passive you are, the more advantage they take of you. And and so I started to f resolve that I had to fight back. I think the first conflicts I started having with people were were around. Uh, Israel and Palestine, the conflict with Israel and Palestine. And I noticed a, a lot of lefties and intellectuals tending in a certain direction and and being pretty uh, um, uh, abusive in the way that they um, attacked arguments. So I decided to stand up against them. And then it be just it it just bled over into pretty much every other <laughs> facet of politics and philosophy that that I uh, aspire to. I feel, I feel like Hollywood was um, pro cancel culture before even it got to campus, but but maybe that's just my my personal experience. the The first time I did Bill Maher's show, and at the time I was I was a one of those very evil Tea Party organizers. So I, I went on to be the whipping boy for the rest of the the panel, and and I, I didn't spend much time in Hollywood. But afterwards, there's a there's a party wherever uh, you know the guests and the crew, and maybe some VIPs gather um, backstage. And there was this really fascinating phenomenon where where my wife and I were were kind of standing alone. Uh, some people were um, offended by our existence, um, but once in a while, someone from the crew would come up, uh, look around, and whisper, "Keep going. I love what you're doing." But they, they were scared to death. I had never seen something like that before. They were scared to death that they would be outed in this in this cultural bubble. And and, and the irony of this story is that Bill Maher is now pushing against uh, back against um, some of the most extreme um, wokeism in his uh, in his audience and his community. But there was palpable fear that you could lose your job just by having a contrary opinion. Yeah, I agree, and it sort of irritates me. Uh, I have academic friends who get the same, who have the same experience of professors coming up to them uh, secretly and saying, God, "We really like what you're doing. Keep that up." And I have actors who DM me all the time about how they appreciate what I'm doing, and my response is, "Fantastic! Now get out there and do it too." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you're laying low it encourages these people to be as brutal as they are. If you stand up, then uh, I know it, it's scary, and it and you may get hurt, you may suffer some consequences, but I mean, those consequences are, that's where your dignity lies, man. You can't, you can't sacrifice your, your values for the sake of a job. I mean, even Ayn Rand would understand men don't live by bread alone, they, right? Howard Rourke was just as happy building buildings as he was working in a quarry. It wasn't about, it wasn't about the job so much as about him being true to himself and true to his vision and values. And when you sacrifice that, you're giving up everything. You're giving up the stuff of life. Don't let these people push you around like that. Look, I mean, our, our the, the public forum is the place where we where we discover what's right and wrong, right? If I have if I have an idea that I think is good, I I discuss it with you and uh, you your your take on on it uh, defeats mine and I realize ah, I, I I need to I need to adjust my sense of truth. I need to, you know, um, change my narrative, and and that's how we that's how we discover truth. We can't shut these things down. I mean, I'm for a cancel culture in the sense that, uh, in the open market of ideas, there are going to be some that simply just die away because everybody knows they're stupid, 
when you push them underground, you give them strength. They go into echo chambers and they metastasize and and who you know and become something much larger than they would if they were in the public forum being discussed, where they'd just be dismissed um, because they're not good. Yeah, yeah, I like your. And this is this goes to sort of classical liberalism, the idea, the the um, fundamental principle that um, good ideas can compete with bad ideas, and that conversation and and reasonable argument is is the only way that we're going to figure stuff out. Because you know the the core of objectivism is that reality exists, and the, you know the the human condition is is trying to figure out. That I mean, we're we're not we're not going to get it perfectly right, but um, at least there's a there's a goal there that that we're trying to achieve. And without argumentation, without the the scientific process, the old scientific process by which you could actually have a paradigm shift and you could have new discoveries and and you could acknowledge that you know what the science wasn't settled at all on that. Um, that's that again. I get that a lot of that from from. Ayn Rand's philosophy, but but you mentioned something. Uh, Howard Rourke is sort of my spirit animal, in a lot of ways, and and one of the things he taught me to do when I was a young man was was to learn how to say no, mm. um, and that was particularly useful to me, um, having had a career in Washington D.C. This is a place that absolutely corrupts and destroys and and bends those principles you're talking about, um, but. Um, having sort of watched him in a, in a fictional way walk away from big opportunities, big financial opportunities were offered to him again and again and again. And like you said, he said, like, I'd rather break rocks than give up this, this value that is so essential to me. Um, part of what we have to do in life is say no. Like most of life is trying to figure out how to get to yes but once in a while, you just got to walk away and say, "Nope, I'm not going to do that." Yep, true. True. The um, the 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 thing that uh, that's fascinating to me is the unwillingness of people to step up, and I guess I guess I understand that in the sense that that quite typically a good idea is is led by some sort of entrepreneurial act where someone sticks their neck out and speaks the truth and probably gets demonized for it. But do you see anyone else um, sort of growing a backbone in Hollywood that's that's like, okay, Mark's doing it. Um, I feel a little bit safer sticking my neck out. <laughs> are they still hiding? Oh yeah, I don't know. Um, most people I think are not inclined to fight like this. Uh, you know, and I'm okay with the division of labor. Some people just don't have the stomach for it. It takes it takes a pretty intense stomach um, because the people you're fighting against are not not kind. They're not gentle. They're not rational. Many of them, and they're they're also they also have very little in the way of conscience. They don't care about destroying you. So I get that somebody would would um, stand down against something like that. I do think some folks are starting to um, like you, like Bill Maher, for example. I mean. The, the absurdity of the radical skeptics and the people who are advancing things like uh, critical race theory, it, it the logical conclusions of them are so awful, and and they're just start and they're making they're just starting to percolate up now. They're just starting to make themselves known, and people are astounded by how ridiculously stupid those conclusions are, and they're starting to lose followers. I think people are starting to drop off. Um, so, I think. I, Look, the beauty of this is, is sort of like the Jacobins, you know, in France. Uh, they're they're this rapidly passionate group of ideologues. Um, they come out strong at first, but they wind up cannibalizing each other and and end up, you know, the premises that they hold are so disorganized. In the case of, you know, these uh, new theorists, um, that they they can't help but disintegrating and falling apart at at some point. Um, the sooner the better, because they damage us less that way. But I think I think they have reality against them, and people are starting to see that. And, and not so many folks in Hollywood. Hollywood's still riding the tide, I think, in general. 
they they're they're afraid they they're afraid in part because a lot of the things that the the people who are the hold these ideas uh, say about them are true. Hollywood is misogynistic. Hollywood is chauvinistic. Hollywood is short-sighted. Hollywood is exploitative. Um, so their feet are being held to the fire in a way that, in some in some respects, isn't false. Yeah. So you were you were born in L.A., um, but why did you decide to get into acting? You know, I'd uh, I was I'd, I'd dropped out of college uh, to to be with this crazy girl and. Uh, I was just working a, a job at a gas station and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life at, you know, 19, 20 years old. And I saw an advertisement for a modeling agency that was uh, giving away classes for free. So I took that and then I took some commercial classes for free. Uh, price was great. And, um, and that guy thought I had talent, set me up with a, an agent and that agent set me up with a school I didn't know that I wanted to do any of that. I had no particular inclination to do that growing up. Uh, but the school introduced me to the art of acting and I became addicted to the art of acting then um, and just focused entirely on getting good at w my calling. I, I discovered that that was my calling. Now, carrying my knowledge over from the class to the actual, uh, actual world was has been, you know, an ongoing learning experience that's for sure yeah i think you told uh michael malice that there's there's a fundamental difference between the art of acting and the business of getting acting gigs and that you you could be the best actor in the world but if if you aren't doggedly persistent in the in the pursuit of your career you're you're going to fail and you're going to be end up driving a cab it's a, it's a brutal industry right very few people make it I mean, it's, it, it takes a lot of endurance for sure. And it takes a thick skin on a certain level, you know, um, and, and you have to realize that, I mean, of course, great talent, I mean, amazing talent can, can break all of these stereotypes that I'm throwing out there. But when you're, when you're going into a room with producers who are, who are doing a show, they're not just looking at you for your acting capability in the scene they're asking themselves do i want to spend the next six years of my life with this human being and so you have to make adjustments to this reality that you know these people want to know that they can live with you and and which is essentially what they're doing become your family for the next six years and that requires you know you to be a little bit more social and personable i didn't understand that first i would come in sometimes fully in character and you know really is emotional and intense and and uh, I had member getting feedback from this one little horror film called Popcorn. A friend of mine eventually did said, oh, yeah, he's the best. He's the best actor we've seen, um, but he's not going to get the part. <laughs> now, it could have been because I was just, you know, they might have thought, wow, this guy's difficult or, or, uh, or they might not have known how to take me. But I realized literally like a decade or 11 years ago that I, I had to also treat this as a business and I had to let people know that. I was actually a pretty good human being to work with, and I liked collaborating. And uh, I thought, you know, ten minds on something is certainly better than one. So I, I wasn't going to make their production worse. I would make it better. And and that was an adjustment that really helped my life quite a bit, to be honest with you. I, that that makes a lot of sense, and it gets to the um, the human side of of individualism. How you how you treat other people is is a reflection on on whether or not you respect yourself, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's certainly not exclusive. I mean, it, 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 the, the beauty of, of, of objectivist morality is that it's just, it's a code for living a thriving life and it's individual. You can be moral on a desert Island. Um, it, it, and that the, the, the values or the virtues of living an individually good life help you to live a perfect, a perfect life with other people as well. I mean, honesty and integrity are fantastic qualities to bring to a social compact with others. Productivity is a fantastic attribute to bring to a social compact with others. Yeah. You know, and I could go down the list of objectivist, uh, objectivist virtues, and they're all great <laughs> for, for engaging with others in a peaceful, harmonious way. 
There's uh, one of my objectivist friends likes to, and it's kind of a gotcha question that's obvious once you hear the answer, but he's like, what's, what's the best way to protect you and your family from harm and violence uh, um, in, imposed by somebody else? And the typical libertarian answer would be get a bunch of guns and, and prepare for war. Um, but his answer, which is obvious, is live in a community where people share those same values of respect for individual life and property. And, and it gets back to the sort of the culture thing, like that's our project is to get um, all Americans to sort of buy into these 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 very like these are basically the values that your mom taught you right um but to me that's the that's the project it's not really politics because politics is downstream of all that and <laughs> and ultimately we get there that way um i want to ask you about uh, one of my favorite films ever <laughs> um, i'd like to say it's a it's an objectivist film i'm not sure it is but the big lebowski how did you, how did you find the coen brothers um because that that's and did you know at the time that this would become a culty thing or was it just a bizarre movie that you were in? Yeah, at the time they had just done Fargo, which was a I, I loved that movie. Um, and when I read the script for Big Lebowski, I I actually thought, well, this is this is pretty funny, but is it as good as Fargo? I don't know. I, I didn't I didn't see it uh, at the moment. And so I went in and auditioned, just like uh, you do for most of these things. And uh, I did well in the first audition. So I got to audition for Ethan and Joel, which is a little intimidating, um, you know, because I I've been a fan of their work up until that time. I don't care if I'm not a fan of your work. If I'm a fan of your work, then I can fangirl in there and it can get a little bit distracting. But they were so down to earth. I walked in and my character's name, um, contrary to what it says on IMDb, was not Jackie Treehorn Thug. It's the blonde man. That's what they call. It. That's what it was. The way it was written in the script, and when I walked in, um, I think it was Joel. Joel's sort of really easygoing, and he's just like, "Well, I just want you to know, Mark, you're the one of the best blonde men we've seen so far." And then I did my shtick, and they're like, "Thank you so much," and I, I ended up getting the part, and um, and uh, it was, you know, of course, great working with them. But but then seeing the finished product, it was. It wasn't like it wasn't in the script, but it was it was just this phenomenal tableau that I hadn't envisioned before. You know, I, it, it's, I didn't see the, the script in the way that they saw it. And they just brought this story to life. And it truly is a, a, a movie that you could see many times. And each time something new is revealed to you um, and it never seems to get old. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really happy that I accidentally fell into that uh, into that job. Because it seems like it was an accident. Yeah, and it's it uh, from from my perspective, like the Coen Brothers and and David Lynch, uh, two of my favorite directors. Um, but their their craft seems to be almost the opposite in the sense that the the more you watch a Coen Brothers movie, you realize just how intertwined every word and every movement and every character it is. It is very much a centrally planned thing and with made by these minds that I couldn't possibly replicate. Whereas you're also in Mulholland Drive. And um, one of the things I like about da David Lynch is that I'm not not always 100% sure what the hell is going on, uh, particularly as his career progresses. How did how did you uh, stumble into Mulholland Drive? Well, see, uh, th that was fun, too, because um... I went in for the audition to discover that David Lynch doesn't audition you. Uh, he wasn't there when I went went, went in, but um, it was just a casting director, and she said, uh, "You just have to talk. Just just talk. And we have the video going. You can just talk." And so I said, uh, oh, "Fuck! I'm doomed. I mean, I'm just going to be. What the hell am I going to do? I, I, and it's going to be stupid." So uh, I said, "Do me a favor. Uh, let's talk about something. Otherwise, I'm just going to be floundering." So I said uh, that the O.J. Simpson trial was going on at the time. So I said, let's talk about that. And she's like, OK. And she started asking me questions. And I started going off, you know, and, and really talking about her dog jumped up in my lap and playing with the dog and just going off. And that got me the part of Joe the assassin. Now, the, the original script concept was a series, a television series that was very linear. You know, David Lynch can also do very good linear films. Um, 
just people don't remember those because he does these sort of dream things. And, uh, and so the script is very clear cut. Um, and it was reviewed as the best new TV show you'll never see because it was too expensive. So David Lynch uh, bought it back, I think from ABC you had it, and then cut half of it and refilmed it into the Hollywood nightmare that I think it's supposed to represent. And like you, uh, I don't know what it really, you know, what all of it means. Um, but I think the great thing about him is, uh, is that makes you struggle with his art for a long time after you've seen it. So you're not, you just, it's not something you go and forget about. It's something you're, you're trying to piece together for years and years and years. I've had people come up to me in the street and try to explain what the movie meant to me. Yeah. Um, Jeff Goldblum is a good example. He's, he's obsessed with that movie. And he, he has, he has spent hours sort of figuring out, plotting out what the nightmare was. And, um, yeah. And, and like the Coen brothers, David Lynch is really, um, really down to earth, really simple human guy. No, no pretense there. And, and, and I don't understand a lot of what it meant either. I mean, I, I looked a certain way in the pilot had a brown eye and a blue eye and we did some makeup stuff and, I told him that and he's like, ah, don't worry about it. So, you know, matching, who cares about matching? Intertwining? Ah, it's not about that. I, I assume like the 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 Jeff Goldblum response is precisely what he's going for. He wants he wants people to fill in some of those blanks for themselves, which in in my mind is what makes it a still an interesting movie to watch. And uh the and yeah, he does some 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 more linear stuff uh, like the Twin Peaks. I I didn't know until you just said that that Mulholland Drive was originally a series. Uh, maybe he'll pick it up like Twin Peaks. I think that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll I'll finish fanboying here too. But but Lost was such an important series for me, um, and um, I also don't know how, exactly how that ended. But uh, you you were Jacob, and and that that started to explain some of the weirdness that we were seeing in the series. To me, the, the entire series was, was really about, um, um, people trying to find redemption for the mistakes they had made in their lives. And, and that, that to me is what made the series so, so interesting. Um, but, but tell the, tell the Jacob story. You, uh, you didn't know what you were getting into there either. Yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah, I had uh, I had four auditions that day that they wanted me to audition for this part on Lost, which was not advertised as Jacob, by the way, because they have a super secret audition process for that uh, show. And uh, my wife convinced me to go. She's like, look, it's the biggest show on television. You have to go to this audition. I don't care if you have to cancel the other three. Go to this. So I didn't cancel the other three, but I, I made it work out. And uh, three le weeks later, I get the part and uh, didn't know that it was Jacob till I'd gone on the set and met Michael Emerson, who said, oh, you're our new Jacob. And that's how I found out that I was uh, playing this seminal character on this show. And I'm glad I didn't know about it until then, because I think I would have been really nervous, to be honest with you. Yeah, Jacob so, sort of ties the room together. Ties the Yes, he does tie it. Sorry, I, I tell you see, some Lebowski it, jokes. Well, no, you tied one thing to that. You did a Coen Brothers thing, right? You, yeah. You interlaced themes. Very good. We'll go back and watch this conversation in six years and see that it all made logical sense, even though it it seems like I'm all over the place. So <laughs> let me. Um, so what what is the art of acting to you? You you said you were inspired by this. It consumed your life. Um, what is that? What what makes you want to do that? Well, I mean, you get to be a kid. You get to be a kid all the time for, for a living. Um, and you get to explore different identities in a way that most people don't. Acting is literally living truthfully under imaginary circumstances or doing truthfully under imaginary circumstances. I don't think there's a single character I've ever played that is anything remotely close to who I am. But there are elements within each character that I can identify with and then explore. And that opens up synapses, that that changes my brain. I get to see another person's, or justify another person's perspective who 
I think in life you probably wouldn't. I played a character in uh, Dexter who was not a good guy, but you know, um, a drug addict, wife beater, a neglectful father. But his purpose in the script was to was was a redemption and to change all that, to reunite with his family and be a good father. He couldn't do it. He just didn't have the the capacity. And there was this guy Dexter who was in the way, but he was trying. And I got to see things from that perspective, you know, from his perspective, which I think opens up your experience in life. It makes you understand a little bit more the human condition. I think by playing outsiders on the fringe like that for a long time, I, I've come to understand my stepfather more than I did when he was in my life. Um, and that's helped me to reconcile, you know, broken parts of myself because uh, I see something from his perspective in a way that I couldn't without acting. Yeah, that's uh, that's powerful, and it 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 reminds me of a question I wasn't thinking about asking. But um, one of one of the things that I've tried to do, particularly in the last five years, as I've gotten into communication and storytelling, and and trying to connect people with people that didn't read all these same books that you and I are talking about, and that's kind of listening with empathy, trying to put yourself in their shoes and trying to understand what they're saying when they say something like democratic socialism or when AOC talks about economic dignity. Um, I have a visceral reaction against those words, but I'm, I'm also like, what is she thinking when she says that? And you discover just how, um, how different words have different meanings and, and, and maybe there's a, there's a common humanity in, in what we're trying to achieve, but, but they're, they're using words differently than you and I would. Yeah, I think that's true for most people. I'm not sure about for an OAC uh, uh, or a AOC. Um, OAC is the Objectivist <laughs> Academic Center. Um, for AOC, totally different things, by the way. Totally different thing. For for AOC and for politicians who espouse these ideas, who who've gone to school and should know better, um, should have compared and contrasted uh, social constructs um, and haven't seemed to have done that. I, I, I'm very cynical about them. I'm less so about the man in the street who just wants to do good, right? A person who thinks about economic dignity and equity, things that w would drive us insane, you know, to hear those words. One, because we know how impossible it is. And two, we know that the only way to attempt to achieve it is, is, is to harm other people to do it and for them to be blind to that. Um, is is understandable is because they think they're acting for the good and they have sort of a Rawlsian perspective of what that means and they don't understand the consequences of that. But I don't forgive politicians and pundits who do it. I'll forgive everybody else, but not someone like her. Because um, she's wielding power and she's trying to use her power to affect, to, to effectively give herself more of it. <laughs> and uh, the person in the street just wants people to be happy. And so you're right, you, coming at the person from that perspective makes a conversation happen, <laughs> for sure. Right. Yeah. It won't happen ordinarily. And when I, when I think about in, engaging her or some of my other progressive friends or even some of my conservative friends, um, I'm thinking about our shared audience more than I am trying to persuade. You know, I'm, I'm 56 years old and I sort of, I'm open to new ideas, but I have a pretty specific framework and how I filter the world and and understand reality. So it's probably going to be a hard project to convince me to become a socialist. Um, but if I'm engaging a, a socialist in a public conversation, i'm I'm thinking about the audience, particularly of young people, particularly people that have left the two party duopoly and are registering as independents or just opting not to to choose one of these these tribal teams, um, that's our audience. Like that, that's who we should be speaking to. And a lot of them would have uh, very different views than me, but I suspect some of the same values if you sort of weed away the, the, the baggage and the, and the rubble, um, which, which kind of gets back to how I started this story. Um, you're an actor in Hollywood who has been very successful. You're, you're, your your resume of of character acting is 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 truly massive. You must you must just work like a dog to get to get those gigs. But uh, 
how, um, and I mentioned the party that you co-founded, but how do you think we reach young people? What's, what's the strategy? What's the goal? Um, yeah, well, I think we just have to make self-interest appealing to them. Um, because right now the romantic vision, which I don't mean romance in the way that, that Rand meant it, but in sort of the Byronic sense, that, the Marxist sense, which I think is a romantic vision, uh, has a great deal of appeal to, to um, youngsters. Um, they like the idea of a solidarity, of moving towards a goal, of this feeling of community. And to give them that, that same sense of belonging and working for something large, maybe, I, I hate to use this language, but bigger than themselves, yeah. I think. And then, and then marry that to the concept of individualism and, I, and I, what I consider to be real liberalism, um, I think that's the way you get to them. You have to give them a moral imperative, which socialism gives them. Individualism doesn't give them the moral imperative. It's there. Um, for sure, but it's there as a contrast to uh, socialism, which, which you know, sort of that that moral imperative has dominated our culture for thousands of years. So, messaging messaging is is going to be very important if you want to beat a, a dominant cultural idea that's been around for two thousand years and has has just gotten more sophisticated over time um, in its evasions. I think in its evasions. Yeah. Um, so uh, give them a moral imperative. Let them know why this is an, a moral imperative. Let, it, let them know why what's good for you is good for me when we're talking about certain concepts. Yeah, you, you mentioned Galt Skulch, and, and I'm, I'm a, a big chunk of my audience will have read this book, so we're probably not spoiling anything. But if you haven't read this book, you need to go get it now and read Atlas Shrugged. But um, Galt Skulch, and that vision of, of mutual cooperation based on a shared set of values. And, and I, I'm not afraid of using the phrase, big, I understand the hesitation, but bigger than yourself, that's, that's sort of the Austrian understanding of, of what free market capitalism produces. It's, it's, it's together we could do something so much bigger than any one of us could have done, but it has to be based on mutual respect and voluntary cooperation. And I'm thinking of this essay from uh, Frederick Hayek, The Intellectuals and Socialism, and and he he worries about the word libertarian, and we didn't get to that, and we're probably running out of time at this point, because um, I know you're you're critical of of big L libertarianism, um, but he says that the one reason that the socialists, and this he's writing in 1949, the one reason that the socialists are more successful than we are, is that they lay out that big bold utopian vision of what the future could be and i think that um i think that 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 idea of 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 individual ownership and the responsibility that comes with ownership and the potential of what we could do together to make a for a more peaceful and and prosperous and and most importantly meaningful society that's the big idea that's the only alternative to this this collectivist nightmare, and I'm I'm ecumenical about about the various philosophies that might get us to that big idea, but ultimately, the building block is the individual. Indeed, indeed, it's just, it's the fountainhead. Yes. Um, yeah, and I, I, at some point we sh we do have to get to big L libertarianism because I think it it presents itself as a solution to what we see is essentially one a duopoly that's two statist uh, concepts sort of that differ on some particulars but agree in, in, in essentials and the libertarianism presents itself as the antidote to that and I don't think it is. I certainly think capitalism is, but I don't think libertarians are advocates of capitalism because um, I, I don't think that you can have capitalism without objective law and states and concept of property and all that. So I do think there's errors in in uh, libertarianism, uh, and you can sort of see the errors in any debate between libertarians. It's just like herding cats, and they they have no real, they have no moral sense of moral objectivity. And there's no cohesive moral fiber running through them, and that will be a problem, I think, for um, 
for anything in the future. For example, I just had a little exchange with Justin Amash, who I think is being looked at in the Libertarian Party, talked about rights being inherent and uh, and not being open to, I forget what the word he, he used, but assent or something like that from other people. And I said, well, they're not inherent at all. They're not inherent. They're, they're certainly conditions of our existence. We recognize them and they have to be recognized. And, the, and without recognizing them, we don't have a peaceful society, but they're not inherent to us. They're conditions for our existence. They're, they're something that we, we invent because we've observed something about human nature. And so we apply that observation to life, but it's, it's not like it's inherent. Other, if they were inherent, if there was, if it was, in, if it was inher uh, inherent quality, then uh, we wouldn't be having these discussions. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get Justin Amash on as well. I, I would love to have that conversation because, because I, I've, I, I watched your critique. Um, I think it was on Dave Rubin, and and I used the word libertarian as as the the as the the least of of the ism evils. I don't I don't like labels that much. I like to talk about values instead of labels, and so I don't I don't use the word objectivist either, because I think I think for a lot of people they either don't know what that is or they have preconceived notions of what those things are, and those aren't those, those aren't that helpful when you're when you're trying to connect with people that think they belong to some other one of these tribes. Uh, but if, if you're up for it, let's uh, let's have that conversation. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get Justin or somebody to, to ably represent that view. Um, I do have a last question for you, though. Sure. Um, you said something to Michael Malice about an Atlas Shrugged project. And my ears perked up. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what is that? I got to know about that. Yeah, so um, so. Uh... Uh, Jacqueline Schumann and Jennifer Buani are two writers, and they have uh, written a pilot episode for a um, a limited run TV series based on Atlas Shrugged called The Strike, which, as you know, was her original title. It is uh, the philosophy is totally intact, but the world is reimagined and the characters are reimagined in, I think, a profoundly, profoundly effective ways. Um, it's also funny in, in spots, um, uh, beautiful, uh, poignant. And I'm not saying this as an objective. When I read it, I read it deliberately as somebody on the outside. What would somebody on the outside think of this? And uh, it is extremely effective uh, because you're getting a great story. You don't know you're getting philosophy in the meantime. And they've, they've written a show Bible. Uh, the first season is, is already done. Uh, they're almost through the second season as well. It's going to be three seasons long, and right now we're shopping it around. We have a shopping agreement uh, uh, with the man who who has the rights to any um, screen versions of it, and we've got uh, we've got some time, and we've been shopping around to showrunners, and they just got a manager, so they're going to be shopping around to producers. We've been in discussions with a lot of people, so uh, I would like to see this. I would like to see this come to pass. Um, it couldn't be any more timely, let's put it that way. And I think it would actually, the, the way the characters are drawn and the nature of the story, um, I think kills about 100,000 Ayn Rand straw men right off the bat. Nice, nice. Yeah. I, I always I always figured it would be much better done as a series than a movie because there's, it's just a, it's a big story. It's a big it's story. A, it's a big story, and these girls have done an amazing job at reimagining it. I think it's the only way to go, to be honest with you. So I mean, I this, a, is, this is something they've been trying to put up for 50 years. I mean, I just yeah. watched a debate between Peacock and some socialists in Canada at the University of Toronto in 1984, and he said that he was working on the story, you know, the, the series in 1984. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll end with a confession. I actually, without hesitation, joined the Screen Actors Guild because I had a three-word spoken part in one of the Atlas Shrugged uh, in the movie series, and I was the Tea Party rabble rouser. And I've spent my entire life not joining a union, but I'm like, to be an Atlas, I'm doing it. Um, I just threw aside all of my principles for that moment. Yeah, uh, well, no, well, you, you, no, I don't think, I don't know, I don't know that you did. Are you still in it? Are you I'm, still in SAG? I don't, I don't actually know. Um, I don't know <laughs> if it's the sort of thing like it's the mob. Once you're in, you can't get out. But I'm being facetious, obviously. 
No, but you no, it's it's it is the mob, but you can get out by not paying your dues. <laughs> so I think you're fine. Your principles well, are intact. Thank you for that. Um, well, this, this was a very cool conversation, and uh, I've, I've been wanting to do it for a long time, and I appreciate you taking the time. And, Thanks, man. And if you're up for it, let's let's do something on libertarianism sometime. Yeah, let's do it. I'm all for it. Cool. Thank you. All right, man. Peace. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people. Mm -hmm.